Welcome. How's everyone doing today? I know, weird time to start a stream. Uh, this will happen more regularly in the next few months, just the way my schedule works right now. I get more, like, US daytime space and less uh, US evening space to stream, so expect to see more of these daytime streams. We're gonna try and keep them casual, uh, keep some of the hard-hitting game analysis for the evening when I know most people are around, but still. It is, uh, good to be here, good to be live after, you know, ending up so far behind on work, uh, on Wednesday that I wasn't able to, uh, I wasn't able to do a stream on Wednesday like I said I was going to, so this is a bit of a makeup stream. You're running some awfully complicated unit tests today, how's mine? Uh, mine is okay, except that I somehow slept on my neck extremely badly. And so everything is pain right now, uh, but that is okay, because we're going to distract myself from the pain by the power of talking about capital D discourse. There's there's plenty of discourse. Good evening and thanks from the Euro time zone. Oh, yeah, fair enough. So. Here's the plan for today. We're gonna spend a couple hours here. Hey, uh, bot, please don't. You're not welcome. Go away. Goodbye. All right. We, so, we, uh, I have some capital D discourse to talk about, because we've got, uh, a lot of discussion right now about historical outreach and why our academic, why is academic history not popular? No, I'm streaming at the same time as OSP, I'm having an internal conflict. Yeah, look, I wasn't, I forgot that they had told me they were going to stream today instead of uploading a video, so, oops. But, uh, yeah. That is a little bit less my fault. But, if you want hard hitting uh, meta discussions of history and historical outrage, this is the place to be. That means that this is a little bit less of a hangout, ju just hang out, watch chill games stream. So, you know, ma make your decisions from there. Anyway. I've got some links pulled up, but I basically just want to have a conversation uh, here about, you know, why, why do I think academic history doesn't get out into the public, and I have lots of thoughts on this. Shockingly, I know, right? Content creator has opinions. More uh, Other breaking news, the, sky, the sun is hot and the sky is blue. Probably, sort of. I live in New England, so the sky is mostly gray. But, I've got some links pulled up, some different contributions to the discourse from different spaces, so I will kind of go over that, and then I will give my thoughts, and we'll have a conversation from there. Sound like a plan? Sweet. Uh, that being said, obviously, announcements. Uh, as always, if you are just tuning in, do say hello. Uh, and consider hitting that follow button to be notified for all sorts of variety content around history, uh, the intersection of history and games, uh, etc. Also, uh, as you watch, you'll accumulate channel points totally free, so if you want to spend those on various things, uh, feel free to do that, but particularly highlighting that uh, Pentiment Community Challenge. Because, uh, you want me to dress up like Andreas Mahler from Pentiment, right? Uh, I want me to dress up like Andreas Mahler, but you all are the ones who get to decide that. So, get those Pentiment tides in. Uh, lastly, we'll obviously be back tomorrow uh, with more God of War Ragnarok. I am very excited to be welcoming Basil Price to the channel for that. Uh, he's incredibly prolific. Like, every time I talk to him, he's got a new project, so there's a ton of, like, Norse literature, fun, weird, late stuff, 
uh, some Beowulf stuff, gender stuff, post-colonial stuff, a lot of fun frameworks to be understanding uh, what the game is doing, and so we're going to be able to talk about that a whole bunch, and it's going to be a great time. So I hope you will all tune in for that tomorrow. But now, let's let's get into it, yeah? Because we've got a fair bit of discourse to get through. First things first, what probably start with the discussion with the question, what counts as academic versus popular writing? I, I'm going to expand the frame on that, right? Uh, there's some people with strong opinions on that in here, uh, up, up in this part of the screen, uh, but right, the big difference is audience, right? The, 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 big, the big difference is who are you writing for? So academic historical writing is writing for other academics, participating in a process of knowledge creation within that milieu. Popular writing is any writing or any content creation, hi, uh, that instead of writing for other academics, is pointing towards a non-academic audience, either for the purposes of entertaining them or for educating them, or ideally both. So, you know, documentary writing, non-academic writing. Historical fiction, non-academic writing. Scripted YouTube videos, non-academic writing. Ask historians, non-academic writing. A trade book, non-academic writing, right? So all of these are sort of public-facing writing projects uh, or creation projects around history. And so the core discourse right now is once again asking why is the stuff written for academics so wildly different from the stuff written for general non-academic audiences and uh, what do we do about pseudo-history and pseudo-archaeology that is ignoring all the academic stuff and just kind of making stuff up and having huge success making stuff up. So, a lot of fun stuff in there. So yes, uh, the, the thing that kickstarted the current round of discourse is this post by uh, Cardiff University archaeologist Dr. Flint Dibble and the statement that he is going to ho hopefully maybe uh, appear on the Joe Rogan experience to debate pseudo-archaeologist Graham Hancock and this is this is interesting right the response to I'll say has been mixed um, but the idea basically, right, is you get an archaeologist and a studio archaeologist in the same room and have them talk about it to an audience of millions? Millions might be an overstatement, but, you know, hundreds of thousands, for sure, because Joe Rogan is incredibly successful. And so there's, some people have been very on board with this, thinking that it's super interesting. Uh, some people have been much less on board. We'll see some of those in a little bit. My opinion on this is, uh, good luck. I'm suspicious. Right, I am suspicious of it. But mostly because this isn't in... Little, we're gonna get to that in just a second. Uh, I'm suspicious of this mostly because it's not going to be a fair audience, because, you know, Joe Rogan is a known, um, known platformer of conspiracy theorists and is very sympathetic to conspiracy theorists. And obviously Hancock is not trustworthy in the slightest. Uh, right. 
If anyone doesn't know who Graham Hancock is, uh, it's fingerprints and the fingerprints of the gods, and Ancient Apocalypse. So a book and a Netflix series, both of which promote the idea that there is an ancient civilization prior prior to the younger Dryas that conveniently dies in the about twelve thousand years ago before any human civilization and leaves no traces or minimal traces of their existence, but created a lot of major monuments, and uh, had very, uh, relatively very advanced engineering skills. Also in Fingerprints of the Gods, they're white. Look, Joe Rogan has had a lot of people. Uh, on before, because the, pl- the podcast has been running for a very long time, so it has had everyone. Uh, so yeah, Graham Hancock is like an OG pseudoscientist. And pseudo-archaeologist. Flint Devil is an extremely good science communicator. So, right, and if everyone I could choose to do this, he's probably one of the best choices. He's one of the people I'm most, I think, I have the most faith in. Because he's very, very good at explaining scientific research. That being said, I don't know that this is a good point. However, one of the common criticisms we're seeing here is, oh, the right comparison to the Ken Ham, Bill Nye creationism debate. If anyone doesn't know that, that was a whole shit show. Uh, you know, science communicator and um, not a research scientist, Bill Nye. Yes, Zoe. Hancock is the pseudo archaeologist of the Netflix show. Uh, Ken Ham was a major creationist uh, televangelist and uh, advocate. And so that was a catastrophic debate for science uh, because Ken Ham is much more skilled at oratory and communication than Bill Nye is. And so Bill and I got kind of smoked. So, yeah. People are pointing that out, pointing out, oh, isn't this just platforming pseudo-archaeology as legitimate, etc, etc, etc? Flint Dibble made a response uh, a couple days ago. Right, January 23rd. So, in the uh, quote in the episode where Joe Rogan invited archaeologists to a discussion with Hancock, he laughed at the idea that we were offering a platform to Hancock. Graham Hancock is a best-selling author with a reasonably successful TV show who Rogan regularly invites on. He's offering me a platform to share what archaeology has to offer with their audiences. Right. It won't hit the same level of coverage. That's, I think, a really important clarification, right? Is that these are not two celebrities going at each other. Flint Dibble is a research professor. In Wales. And so... Right, the the audience... The audience already is there, right? Joe Rogan and Graham Hancock already have the audience. This is not platforming... This is not archaeologists platforming a pseudo-archaeologist. This is pseudo-archaeologists being willing to platform an archaeologist. It's an interesting experience. It's an interesting alternative. So, but yeah, right, this is something, right, I wish Dr. Dibble the best of luck. Uh, it is not going to be a fair debate, it is not, Rogan is not going to be a particularly unbiased observer, because he's going to put himself in the center of a window that skews much more to arche- pseudo-archaeology than to um, actual archaeology. So, they're gonna be suspicious, but, you know, 
Flint Devil has years of experience doing extremely good archaeological outreach work. So if anyone's going to do a good job here and be able to, you know, change some minds, it's going to be him. So best of luck to him. Now, so much for this. This obviously inspires a lot of discourse uh, with people, a lot of people being extremely suspicious. Um, however, the suspicion also uh, can be a little bit toxic. Right? It can be a little bit toxic. Because the response to pseudo -arch or to pseudo archaeological audiences tends to be dismissal, right? We look at this and we go, oh yeah, um, we've already lost that chat, right? If they're listening to pseudo archaeology, well, we've already or pseudo history, we've already lost that chance. These people are past saving, and we, being academic historians and past saving being in heavy scare quotes. And so responding with a lot of, you know, suspicion and being like, wow, this is all bullshit, right? I mean, on the one hand, it is. On the other hand, there's some criticism that that is not a very effective way to go, which brings us to our main comment or our main one for today by at beloved of oasis ancient alexandra here uh who made a very very worthwhile blog post here and it's worth going through in detail here uh and seeing what we get because overall i just want to make this positionality clear I don't agree with everything in this, but I agree with most things in it, and it merits a level of nuanced engagement that Twitter doesn't get, uh, Twitter can't do, but uh, I think there's some points in here that I want to highlight, um, talk about, and get my opinion on, so we'll go through this in some detail. So right, starting right, the concession of, you know, these little historical myths, right? Atlantis being Thera. And how Ring Ring, uh, Ring, Ring of Roses is about the Black Death, right? All these regular myths. And so, right, to speak to Dr. Dibble specifically, right, should archaeologists and historians debate pseudo-historians on politically extreme podcasts? No. Of course not. Nope. Nuh-uh. Nah. No. So. That still opens the question, though, of should we engage, or should academic historians be engaging regularly, and if so, how? Right. Academics in general do not spend enough time conversing with the general public. Being as doc in documentaries doesn't count. The odd public lecture once every five years does not count. I mean a dialogue, not a soliloquy. I updated it. God damn it. Love that. I love OBS, I promise. Fine, it's fixed. R facts should not be debatable. Little, that's the problem, isn't it? Um, we're gonna. Let's see. Does it say? No. It's in a different spot. The, the problem is academic history, right, is not about facts. History as a discipline is about narrativization based on evidence. It's not about 
stating facts. And so given that history as a profession is about discourse and interpretation, saying facts should not be debatable is not a meaningful counterpoint here. It doesn't mean, right, it, it doesn't mean that th there aren't facts and that we shouldn't engage with evidence as thoroughly and completely as possible. Uh, and it doesn't mean that we should, that pseudo historians and professional historians uh, are operating in the same skill set, uh, but it does mean that there's plenty here that's like different and doesn't engage in quite the same way, right? Exactly. Jeremiah says it better than I do. The point is that there's no, there's no real facts about it, there's mostly stuff we think we understand and a lot more we don't know, for sure. Which is exactly what pseudo-histories rely on, pushing their narrative as the best uh, explanation. Right, well, so we're going to get to this. You're thinking more in terms of what we know is not true? We're going to get to that in just a moment. But yeah, right, the note here I think is really good. Academics have no idea what the state of pop history is and have the audacity to be shocked when it's in a complete state. When it's just like that. Notably, right, something I try and do with my little corner of pop history is, you know, play a lot of games. Let me tell you, when pseudos accuse academics of keeping secrets, they are not wrong. Don't mean that individual scholars don't set the astronomical prices for monographs, etc, etc. The academic industry gatekeeps real hard. Academics, right, for most, the vast majority of us, I would say, um, I count myself as one even though I'm not directly in a history degree, but most professional academics will more than happy uh, more than happily share every PDF they have with you. But you have to actually ask them. So, yeah. And... Here we go. Uh, the general public have a genuine interest in history. If academics aren't willing to engage by writing paperbacks and fronting documentaries, then pseudo historians will uh, capitalize on the gap in the market, and this is the key, it's a long con. The more academia clams up, the more pseudo historians can spin the narrative of secrets and conspiracies. Well, so this one I'm less sure on. I'm going to elaborate on this moment, this in a moment, but this frames it as this frames it as an open field that is able to be contested right that oh right now historians could do uh, documentaries paper getbacks flood the market and then pseudo historians won't have a place to work because good history is going to be innately superior. And so this will close this to prevent this. And I don't think I agree. And that's not good news. That's not good news, but I'm willing to have discussion about it. But I think the, this, the problem is that there was a gap in the market 35 years ago, and it has since been filled. And that's not good news. But it makes it extremely... <sighs> It makes this kind of a weird advocacy point. Like, I agree that yes, it needs to happen, 
but framing as it needs to happen because it fills a gap in the market, I don't think it's true because it, the gap's been filled. And there's a lot of structural things that now that the gap has already been filled by pseudo history, is going to be extremely, extremely difficult to actually compete and crush that. Like, ooh, a hot new documentary about XYZ something. Well, the subject matter overlaps with ancient aliens, so, uh, how many people are going to jump ship from ancient aliens to go watch the new one? They may watch the new one out of interest, but when push comes to shove, are they going to change plat or really change what creators, what authors, what documentarians, what TV shows they're watching? Like, I don't know. Anyway, moving on. Do to do. Firstly, a stop being condescending. Yep. Dumb, stupid, ri ridiculous, ludicrous, crazy, bad shit, trash, bananas, ignorant, moronic, ass, nine, cuckoo, farcical. We use eye rolls, dumpster fires, side eyes, and shade. Publicly, this read about pseudo historians, however, warranted we feel it is, we are by extension being publicly rude to their audience who have been persuaded by them. So, on the one hand, I agree here. On the other hand, this is complicated, right? Th this is complicated. So, my criticism of the comment here is mostly that there is there are several different publics going on uh, that are just kind of being conflated. And these publics merit different responses and it is an unfortunate consequence of social media that um, sorting out which public merits which response is a problem. Right, so there is a set of people who read studio history who are well-intentioned, intelligent people who are doing the best they can with what they have access to, and what they have access to is not very high quality. Right, it's objectively not very high quality and that is creating narratives that poorly use evidence that don't have a strong framework to interpret things and are peddling a narrative uh, that is not supported by the evidence that they have. Okay. There is a public that is this. This public needs to be engaged respectfully with high quality historical um, public facing historical works in the media that they are consuming. So if they are reading books, we need good trade books. This is where uh, folks like, I don't know, Mike Dash uh, fill a really important niche of doing relatively high quality, not always perfect, but relatively high quality, really thoughtful, well-structured, popular history. If they're working in blogs, Someone like Brett Devereaux does really useful work. Um, if they're looking at video content, the study of history in the Middle Ages did really good work. Uh, I think they're still making stuff, though, but the creator passed away unfor unfortunately and tragically, which makes it uh, difficult. So, this is... Right... If for some strange bizarre reason they're mostly consuming games, uh, hello, bonjour, good to see you all. You should all tune in. I promise I'm talking directly to you right now. 
uh, but right uh, for that that particular public that's what a lot of, that's who a lot of outreach projects are already trying to target right uh, a lot of trade books are trying to target them uh, my stream is obviously trying to target a lay audience but bring in like high quality academic perspectives that make it fun you guys can tell me if I'm succeeding though the fact that you're still tuning in suggests for at least the 16 of you that are here right now I succeeded but right why is this just looping repeatedly there we go uh, but there are other audiences here right there are audiences that are buy into this because it for ideological reasons right they'll buy into something like ancient apocalypse for ideological reasons for racism um for because it supports their worldview uh with that worldview being specifically designed to denigrate indigenous people people of color non-euro people etc um right or because they use it to support uh, ultra toxic masculinity uh or a host of other ideologies that are actively harmful and things we do not agree with here right things that we find actively detrimental to a more inclusive uh, more intellectually interesting world and we in this, this case means both professional academics but also this particular community right That community, it is impossible to engage with in good faith. If you try and engage in good faith, they will take that, twist it, and uh, maul it into personal attacks, harassment, uh, or decontextualize it to the point that they find it supports their worldview instead of working against it. So, right, as far as Deplatforming uh, with the goal of minimizing harm from those communities and their engagement with serial history. This is actually not the worst strategy. It's not the only valid strategy, but it is one that actually has had success uh, in terms of right satirizing, being like, "No, nah, they say it," and for. Uh, a third-party audience, right? An audience that is not already bought into the pseudo-historical rhetoric, but is perhaps curious about it, seeing a bunch of people who are regarded as experts and do outreach work, being like, wow, this sure ain't it, Chief. Uh, this is effective in sort of undercutting the rhetorical narratives of the space or of people who interpret pseudo history for bigoted ideological ends. So there is a public for whom this is pretty. There is a public for whom this is an appropriate response and a public for whom this is an effective form of reaction and sort of warning people away from something harmful. Social media means, of course, that uh, both of those publics, or all of those publics, get hit by the same reaction. The last note here, um, before we move on to later things that I have, is that it's not reasonable to expect academics, no matter how talented they are, no matter how dedicated they are to the ideas of outreach, to be responding to the same frequently asked questions that are fundamentally misguided over and over and over and over and over with repeated good grace each time. So to use an example from my own content, right, the first seven times a game used a vavisir and called it 
something ancient. You know, I can explain. You know, it's not that. It's a 19th century rune stave based on French grimoire traditions. It's not Viking period. It has nothing to do with the Vikings. The 700th time I've seen a vague view, sir. I'm not going to take the time to explain that again. I assume you all know. Because you're hanging out. I'm going to look at it, I'm going to roll my eyes, I'm going to shake my fist, and I'm going to move on. Is that being insulting to game devs who may have not may genuinely not realize that the baby is not ancient? Well, yeah. Is it a reasonable part uh, of academic outreach to take every claim 100% seriously every time? No. If you're asking academics to do that, they're going to burn themselves out. Right? That, that is just asking academics to burn themselves out because you aren't reaching everyone at once and so you're constantly spinning your wheels in the same ground and that is something extremely harmful uh right it's something extremely frustrating uh, something uh, that takes out some of the joy of finding the interesting things highlighting those and making things like really cool Crosslinking can help with this, uh, but, right, there is a point to which saying, responding to something that repeats, something that repeats claims that the academic community has been doing outreach, outreach work to debunk for 30 years, some folks doing it for literally their entire lives, reacting to the same claims. Seeing the same claim again? What are you supposed to do? Right? There's a point... There's a point where getting mad at people for expressing frustration and being human and trying to undercut it with uh, memes, gifs, and comedy... Don't, not, not super feeling that. Now, there's lots of folks, so, the overall summary here, right, I agree with this, but there's some nuance, there's some nuance here in terms of who is the public that is being referred to, are there groups to whom this is a uh, necessary or reasonable response, and should we expect academics working in outreach to be perfectly gracious machines? The answer is so complicated. Alright. Now. Onward. When you start valuing public engagement, guest posts on websites like Bad Ancients can get 10 times as many hits as in hit journal article. A reply on our Ask Historians can see more engagement than any chapter in an edited volume. This is true. My uh, most viewed post uh, answer on Ask Historians got over 10,000 impressions and 2,000 upvotes. So. You know, pretty cool. Start putting recorded talks on YouTube. Start making mini documentaries. Advertise lectures in more places than just the freaking listserv. Man, that your talks are hybrid. Universities should do that. Um, but flood every platform with solid scholarship. No. So, no, no, this is a great idea, right? This sounds phenomenal on paper. I have concerns. The concerns are, chat, let's, let's make a poll. Let's make a poll. Uh, where did my quick actions go? Why did the poll go away? Goofy thing. Um, Oh, 
All right. You know what's gonna be yelling about accessibility? Yeah. Uh, personal life activism as academic. Well, one major issue with the access, you can flood Twitter with all kinds of links to academic scholarship. There's no point if no one can access it aside from academics themselves. True. Uh, but, you know, they're saying, oh, put talks online, uh, do tertiary scholarship, etc. Now, I am curious. Even more inherent difficulty is who has the time. True. Uh, well, ideally, universities are paying for that time, right? That's that's the note here, is that the universities are paying, should be providing the training, providing the time, working with the media studies department to create, like, really polished stuff. Do that outreach work. Uh, now... I'm very curious. Chat, make sure you fill out that poll. There are 16 of you in chat and there's only 4 votes. Do quick click in and decide, are you currently looking for new history content creators? Yes, no, or if the algorithm blesses me with a new one. Get those votes in, because it uh, makes that really important. All right, and the results are in. Are you currently looking for new history content creators? One person said actively yes, one person said actively no, and five people said if the algorithm blesses you and you get recommended one. Or recommended was uh, someone you trust suggest them. Uh, it just, it just ended, chat. It just ended. So, yeah, I missed it. It, it does pop up at the top of chat, um, whenever those, uh, I start a poll. So, just for future reference, it shows up at the top of the chat box. But yeah. Right? This is in a community that is presumably reasonably engaged with historical outreach and trying to find high quality stuff. Like, I mean, you like me. I assume you do it because you like me, but I assume you also do it because you like the idea of good quality historical uh, discussion over on um, public media, right? Zoe, you just don't have a lot of spoons to spare because you're actively in research. Exactly. Someone's working full time, uh, and so if someone's right, if someone's working full time, who knows how much time they have to actually consume historical content? Yeah, Dragon Wolf got a lucky experience. The curator for the museum ship, uh, New Jersey, does some good stuff on the museum's YouTube channel. So, best thing the algorithm has thrown at you lately. That's super cool. I love that. I'm glad people aren't locating that. But what that actually means, right, in terms of what that actually means for the market, is that a relatively engaged com if a relatively engaged community is sticking with the creators they already have, unless if a f someone they trust recommends them as someone worth your time, well. Where does that leave us for discoverability? Does flooding every platform with solid scholarship just result in 5,000 creators with 100 followers each? Like, maybe that's already a success. But... That what that results in is effectively still a hyper-fragmented 
um, awareness of high quality information and super fragmented access to that information because no one can discover your content. Doesn't matter how good it is, doesn't matter how polished it is. Building an audience from nothing is extremely difficult work. And we are so far behind, right? Literally decades behind that work of audience building. So, the, the statement of just flooding everything sounds great. Don't think it works. Exactly. Discoverability is worth considering given how the last few months have taken a severe hit to discoverability on one of the most prominent sites there is, especially for the historical community. Exactly, right? The Twitter catastrophe has made discovery on Twitter significantly harder. Uh... YouTube algorithm changes have seen uh, viewership and ad revenue from that viewership for history content and creators fall off a cliff. Even before the hol or the post holiday crunch, uh, YouTube YouTube's had some algorithm changes that dislikes long form content and uh, that makes it hard. To Actually, they've had some changes that prioritize high long form content too, but they keep switching their mind, uh, and so discoverability on YouTube. Uh, much less profitability on YouTube is actually down right now. Twitch is looking like there's not much of a market for it here, I'll be honest. It's pretty small. Um, blogs, right, as blogs proliferate, good luck to like locating blogs unless if someone happens to direct link you. The general sense you get from other early career humanities academics is that we tend to have limited bandwidth. Rather than flooding every platform, a targeted approach seems like a better tactic for everyone involved. Exactly. Notably, right, what the, what my solution to this is, is that we need consortia. Right, we need basically a media company that is specializing in platforming academics. Provides a nice centralized location for a wide array of historical content that you can build a single audience and have a single st a one-stop shop for a wide array of material. Right? A collaborative consortium, content uh, communities that are actively cross-linking, collaborating, kind of working together either on a single channel or in a small network of channels works great. Uh, sort of uh, signing on to people with, who are already successful, already have an audience, and being willing to do sort of back-end research work to improve the places that already have an audience, where they're willing to take that help. That's helpful, right? Flood, targeting that flooding rather than just everyone is throwing stuff out on their own and hoping an audience will come really targeted strategies that work with established creators uh, and work with uh, established audiences is super duper important here. You think the BV New Jersey curator said at one point that a 20 minute video is $50 something? That's dirt cheap. That's dirt cheap. Holy moly. A 20 minute video could easily run you several hundred dollars in editing costs alone. You have to say you discovered multiple other streamers because you had them on your stream. Right? Sa Sasa and Sophie Quest are the two that come to mind. Exactly. That's something I think is super important because guess what? It uh... It's now that works. If you have bandwidth for other streamers, well, you're not necessarily going to be able to do that unless if you actually talk to them. Right? Right? Neural museums are really important in public education. We have a really high trust in museums, even in recent years. Yeah, we're going to talk about museums specifically in just a sec.
Yeah, Mozilla Realms also work on outrage and fighting, so the most reach and traction is if you go around shouting provocative things, uh, and the audience starts arguing. Exactly, right? Because it's all engagement metrics, and saying, great, I lo good work, does not inspire a 100 comment thread. But yes, you are correct. Uh, and unfortunately, right, academic, really nuanced academic work does not necessarily uh, translate into that. Anyway, let's move on. Um, best way to gauge levels of knowledge outside the ac academy is to have conversations with non-academics. Conversations where we don't do most of the talking. Conversations where we ask the questions. Only then can we understand what we should be saying. Why do you believe in Atlantis? Where did you learn about the 300 of Thermopylae? Do you know where to find reliable information? This is good. Yeah. I think in... Coming next week, you'll have a boxing match to determine who is finally correct about the late medieval period. True. Get hype. Actually, get hype because I'm going to have a book historian on for Pentiment uh, one week from tomorrow. We're going to get to talk about all the bookishness of Pentiment uh, and geek out about it, which is going to be very fun and very non-argumentative because we're on the same wave wavelength of uh, loving it. Anyway, main concern here, fists and arguing for all those clicks, exactly. Look, book is, uh, we're having a Latin transcription slash boxing match, so, uh, you know, is there's chess boxing, we're doing Latin transcription boxing. I'm sure that'll be entirely not niche content, but I'll get tons of attention. Yeah, I'm worried about this because, um, you know, fucking god, my current studies, right, Chad, as you know, I'm finishing up a degree in cultural heritage right now. Part of that is reference, right? Part of that is getting, stud getting to work on actually doing reference work. Getting people to actually talk about these questions is extremely difficult. I wish it wasn't difficult. I'd love to get more information. Getting people to actually open up about where they got information, piece together why they think they know something, uh, and have an honest conversation about the process? Really hard. And that's just to say, hey, what are you interested in seeing at the museum today? Right? I'm at, I work at a museum. Welcome. Uh, hi, hi there. Uh, where do we start? Uh, great question. What sort of stuff are you interested in? I don't know, art? Right. Reference work works on much the same idea as fortune telling. Of that there's a lot of picking up whatever they give you. Right. Fully cold reading someone and making a guess as to what they are interested in is extremely hit or miss, and that doesn't actually tell you much about the person. It may give them the information that they want, but that is a you got lucky rather than you actually learn something about the person. If the audience that you are trying to listen to is not actually willing to tell you much of anything about what what excites them, what makes them interested, uh, and actually have that conversation, you cannot force that conversation to happen. And you can't do that reference work to try and piece it together. Right? Like, you can't just retrofit this brute force uh, reference work. They have to actually be willing to have that conversation. And so, interrogating them is going to feel like an attack. So, yeah. Right? Johnny, you have an example. You have a super great case. You have a very specific and narrow subject stood behind you that was being an anchor for people's interest. 
but also what kinds of incentives they have. Exactly, right? Working at literally one of the most pseudoscience happy sites. Uh, pseudoscience, the pseudo historian's favorite. Is pretty helpful there. But yeah, uh, with thousands, if not tens of thousands of pieces, the number of things you have to be aware of expands exponentially. Exactly. And th just even without pseudo history, just getting people to tell you what they're interested in and why? Freaking impossible. So, like, again, these are all great things. I think we should be agitating for this. I am worried about the methodology. Oh, I like Romans. I like Impressionists. It's like, fine, we can do that. Um, but that doesn't tell you anything. Right? These... There are people who will happily have... Be absolutely willing to have this conversation, and we should seek them out and then have those conversations. But... God, it's not easy. I'm still, like, what? I'm in my third year of doing this channel. I'm still trying to find out good ways to actually engage with, like, better conversation stuff. Really better conversational uh, information uh, to get a sense of that. Because thus far, right, my strategy has mostly been, let's look at media that's been created, right? How do I have this conversation? Well, I boot up Assassin's Creed on the assumption, on what is honestly an assumption of, hey, you know, this is a, a piece of media that reflects a cultural landscape and cultural understanding. It's also going to be influential to how people imagine the past, and so engaging in conversation with the game, or with God of War Ragnarok, for instance, is a way of having a conversation where we listen and we react. I think it's a good assumption. I think it works. But I am still trying to figure out how to have better conversations with more people. On that note, I appreciate all of you who are talking in chat and participating in the conversation. And if you are lurking, consider joining in the conversation. I genuinely lo love when new people are showing up in chat uh, and talking and hanging out and participating. So consider doing that. We don't bite. In worst case, I'm a little bit too enthusiastic. It's fine. Also, um, this sentence right here, by the way, based reception studies. My, my academic, some of my academic training is in reception studies and afterlifes of materials. So, uh, you know, big fan there. Absolutely base take of do reception studies. Don't prioritize just the past as the past. Anyway. Concise summaries? Uh, where does it say that? Oh yeah, proposed concise and clear summaries on myriad of topics. Yeah, precise clear responses is, I think, more helpful. Uh, but I think there's a space for both, right? Summaries, if you're working in like YouTube, I think, um, broadly speaking, concise clear summaries are more useful. You know, there, there's a reason why I continue to... Uh, Apart from having a long friendship with the folks at OSP, there's a reason why in academic circles I'm still willing to say, hey, no, they're doing good work, They, we should be prioritizing them, or we should be supporting them, because they do concise, clear summaries, and that's cool and good. So... Uh, it depends on the context as well you want a summary or a response, but yes. Uh, academic sneering is so widespread, yeah. Um, 
that being said, see what I said earlier, right? See what I said about 30 minutes ago for that. <sighs> now, notably, uh, Alexandra here does seem to be talking about academics who don't do public work generally, except to do except to roll their eyes at XYZ pop history claim. I agree. Those people need to stop. They need a, it's time for them to stop. For people who already dedicate a lot of time to it though, uh, right, it depends on what specific goals do they have right then, how human do they allow themselves to be, what public are they talking to that shapes that response, and as long as they're be putting in a modicum of um, intelligent thought uh, and intentionality behind that, I think there's room for a wider array of responses. Oh hey, speaking of new people, uh, what a name. Uh, Toy Story, hello. Um, right. So, I don't know, I'd use an example here, right? Dr. MRO, who I've gotten the pleasure to do panels with before, uh, is extremely active on Twitter and is extremely active on sort of messing, um, is very quick to result jump on that uh, gift train on the sort of undercutting via mockery by calling things out directly uh, and by saying when things are bullshit. That's a super valid strategy. Dr. MRO has a lot of intentionality behind that uh, and like it does super needed work in that space. It's not a strat that works for everyone. And so, if the blanket dominant response is nearing, that's kind of an issue. But I don't think everyone who's doing the eye rolling, calling it out, saying when things are bullshit, or ridiculous, or stupid, or bigoted, or whatever, whatever the thing actually is, whatever response is merited there. So, I don't fully agree with this either. Um, so, right, overall, right, we're coming from a, I think Alexandra and I are coming from the same space of really caring about this outreach work, uh, and broadly agreeing that what's going on right now ain't it. Uh, but, overall I find this blog post to be a bit more aspirational than it is um, really grounded in understanding, uh, or that's not really a good way to phrase it, really grounded in a strong um, experience working on a variety of platforms and the specific challenges each of those platforms cause. Right? Exactly, right? This is, this is if I had to bring it into the idea of like institutional, what's the institutional documentation, this is a really good statement of purpose. Like th this is a good call to action and a uh, statement of what the vision could be. What are the things that universities should value? What are the things historians should value? Uh, what are our priorities when how we broadly do engagement? There's a lot of specific policy in here that remains super underdeveloped uh, that, and without that policy, I worry that that energy, right, you can't create a bunch of energy and then it doesn't really have a direction to go and it disperses to minimal end. Because I'll be honest, right, if you're making stuff that you're putting a lot of effort into and it's extremely high effort, uh, and it just doesn't get attention because the market is already saturated. Where are you gonna be? It doesn't feel good, it doesn't work well. So, I think there's a level of intentionality and focus 
that is missing from the conversation to date, uh, that... And there still needs to be a lot of experimentation to figure out how best to develop that policy. So, this is an important thing, this is a good thing, um, but there, there's some new ones in here that I take some issue with. I think there's room for a diversity of approaches, uh, and a lot of room in terms of creating effective platforming in the realities of social media environments in the, 20, in the 2020s that needs to happen before we can be like, oh yes, we have done the thing. You're starting another barrel of a gun for an hour-ish long video essay for which you might seem the only person in the world you can ever buy. Like, however necessary I feel it is, getting only 72 views for it or the like is something I know will suck. Exactly. Audience building sucks. Audience building is the worst. And so... Uh, I appreciate every one of you, but, like, the, the mechanics of getting more eyeballs on a thing is extremely difficult. And while I love that we have got a dedicated community here uh, that is engaging, like, I don't know how to get more people. Bring in more friends and make that happen. So, you know, uh, uh, do, take that how you will. It's from a place of wanting more friends. Uh, <laughs> because it, it deserves it. As an additional note, right, um, they... Specifically, I mean, yeah, that goes true in general, right? If you folks are creating things in this space, please, please use my community spaces uh, to help promote them. We've got a channel specifically for that, and, uh, well, you know, that doesn't turn everything into... <coughs> doesn't turn everything into guaranteed more eyeballs. Uh, you're welcome to use that space, because that's what it's... We all do better when we're working together. As an additional note, by the way, uh, right... There are a good example of the structural things in a space that I have no familiarity with, documentaries and journalism. Uh, this, this article works great, uh, describing what is termed the Rolodex problem, uh, where journalists reach out to people they already have had contact with, i.e. people they've already worked with, which consolidates academics into a handful of people for each field. So, you know, Mary Beard is never going to have a problem getting a media appearance. Brett Devro probably not going to have a ton of problem getting a media appearance. Richard Cole, over uh, who we had on for the Forgotten City streams, may have a little bit more trouble getting a media appearance. Uh, just because he's less has less of an established contact. Uh, this changing, by the way, his everything I've heard says that the Oracle VR project that his team was working on, uh, that's finally out in London, everything I've heard says that's super cool. So, I don't know, if you're in the area, maybe try and look up the Oracle VR stuff to take a look at that. Or, my, some of the other folks that I've had on before, are they going to be, they're not going to be asked for media appearances. Exactly. And so, right, if you get cold emailed, it's just kind of weird. There's a couple of cold emails I've been sitting on. Uh, if you get DM'd on Twitter, that's super weird. Uh, and so building that contact is difficult. Right? Building that contact work for other academics is already super difficult. Uh, but building that contact work for journalists and media is equally difficult. And so, it bears saying, right, the structural systems that exist don't, are not conducive to the sorts of actions that are being advocated for. And, you know, we should resist that. We should resist the urge to fall into capitalist structural systems and instead figure out a more collaborative approach. That being said, at some point you need to work within the systems far enough 
to actually have the impact you want to have. And that's where I think, right, consortia consolidating resources onto single platforms, uh, creating centralized locations that can be universally published, uh, and pushed to br bring an audience all to the same place instead of to a hundred different places is useful. Yeah. Yeah, Zoe, yeah, right? I mean, right, whenever Emmett's been on, they've talked about their experiences with consultancy work uh, and how rubbish that can be. So, you know, this is not an easy problem. And so the folks working in this will be the first ones to tell you how damn hard it is. And so saying more people should do this is both good and insufficient without really targeted policy to make sure that happens. Now, speaking of Askasaurians, that was something that was brought up as something super successful. And guess what? Askasaurians. Uh, the full disclosure is that I am a flared user on Askasaurians. I kind of a little bit dox myself here, but that's fine. I'm not subtle about it. Uh, I do work on Ask Historians regularly. I did answers on Pentiment and American Gods in the last month. Truly, I have a brand. But this was a super interesting co question, right? Uh, in terms of Ask answering the questions people are asking and having that, like, listen and response to it. Ask Historians is a super interesting case. As an access of 1.6 million people, uh, theoretically. Plus regularly ending up on R all, plus other stuff, right? But this is a super powerful platform. But since it's a Q&A forum, Right, the questions people ask, and the questions that we are equipped to answer, are it really clearly shows how wildly different they are. And so, apart from the questions of what did so and so think about X, we've got no idea. We have no archival material left from them. We can make some guesses based on all their cultural moments. Um, other aspects of this culture would lead to XYZ conclusions, probably, maybe. Uh, but, you know, without, we don't have their writings to actually answer that question. Oops. Uh, but, they had a meta question, right? Academic history is in trouble, but the public demand for history content is enormous. As Restricted Data, who was extremely, extremely cool, said, uh, there's a vast disconnect between what people want for entertainment purposes and what they want for educational purposes. As I said, most history engagement is entertainment. Right? There is plenty of people who go in for self-improvement, but there are many, 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 uh, and self-improvement meaning, right, learning things for the sake of learning them. Finding that inherently satisfying. Uh, but there's way more people who are in it to be entertained and to be told a story about the past in an interesting and entertaining way. Ideally, things do both, right? You, you walk out of it having learned something, but... Nah. Why are demands low? Okay, so education, right? This is talking about largely the academic sector and being like, wow, uh, it doesn't... Nah. Doesn't work super well. Lots of other good answers here, right? Lots of conversation. There is way more conversation here. But right, as it says, right, Agent DCF, another quality contributor, another good person here. Stuff about academic history being too jargony, TikTok being free, giving people access to historical content, whatever, all that falls apart. We set history against other disciplines because they're also jargony, right? They're also jargony, but culturally historians aren't valued because freaking contemporary culture does not value cultural heritage work. It super doesn't. Uh, unless if you're at Harvard, uh, pay is egregiously low and that's and that's a problem. 
History doesn't have a statement right now of why is it critical. I mean, there's a lot of things we can talk about about critical thinking skills. Oh, uh, being able to interpret evidence, media study stuff. But right, there are other degrees that do all of those things. History doesn't really have something I feel that makes it critical besides lots of people consume past-related content. So... Like, that's... an issue. All of this is an issue. Uh, so there's... just not a lot of cash floating around for people who work in outreach in history. That's a structural problem, but it's also one, right, expecting historians to um, starve to death while working against pseudo-history, right? Our obligation is to work against pseudo-history and to flood the map with high-quality stuff. Also, you'll make $100 a month doing that. No. No. That's not sustainable. I like eating. On that note, please subscribe. S but like, there's there's just no resources around for it. And so yeah, right. The academic market is um completely crushed, um completely obliterated. And I think, in turn, right, the outreach market has even less cash floating around. So, unless if you're one of the small handful who makes it big, uh, Brett Devereaux has been open about how much he makes. It's like 50 grand a year, uh, which is not good pay, but it's at least livable pay. Uh, but he is wildly anomalous. He is utterly, insanely anomalous in terms of the, uh, a collection of unnegated pedantry being successful. Most people working in history that I know are working in the hundreds of dollars a month, if we're lucky. There's plenty who are working on a budget of free. And so what the hell are you supposed to do? And exactly, uh, that's getting without any, that's without any of the conversations about collective memory, uh, the role of public institutions, etc., etc. Um, but you know, we can actually talk about uh, museums here, uh, right? While historical museums in the U.S. have been hit by declining interest, uh, there was also a comment in this one. Uh, I believe that was specifically talking about Altac. Let's see. Did it specify? Was it here? No. Okay, it wasn't in this one. Uh, shame. Somewhere I saw a comment that Altac needs to be doing that. Wolfie, thank you for the five gifted subs. I was. Being partially facetious, but also very, very genuinely appreciated, as always, my friend. Um, we're gonna, there was a comment somewhere uh, that I'd seen. There it is. I know what I propose can hardly be implemented overnight and require a complete overhaul of what uni departments value, but there are so many historians. With collaboration, the added workload would be minimal. No. Also, Alt-Ac can and should be doing the heavy lifting. Alt-Ac, in this case, right? Alternate academia. So, it's those things that are adjacent to academia, but are not themselves. Oh, and uh, Dark Weather, thank you for the follow just now. I hope you're enjoying this just chatting uh, about pseudo-history and historical outreach and why the heck I do what I do, basically. Right. That comment spooks me. I thoroughly do not like that sentence. Chat, here's a fun guessing game for you. How many 
how many people, uh, or sorry, when writing a museum label, how many words? No, no, th those are two big numbers. Let's try this again. Uh, when someone visits a museum, what is the average amount of time they spend looking at a single object? This is based on mostly studies, uh, like observational studies. Yeah, in a museum, what is the average amount of time that someone spends looking at an object? Yeah, KJ, like average people. All right, we've got 10 seconds, 20 seconds, less than a minute, 30 seconds, less than that, less than five minutes, anywhere between seconds and a minute. I've got bad news for you. You're all too high. You are all too high for the most recent studies. It is six seconds. Right, a most recent study for art museums was saying it was an average of six seconds. Relatedly, how long do you, how many words do you think a museum label can be before people stop reading it? How, how many words can a museum label be before people just start stop reading? Yeah. If I, if I remember correctly, wasn't it about 60? Yep. It's about 60. If it's one of the big ones at the start of the gallery, you can get away with less than 150. Uh, but for an object label, it's about 60 words. You know how little you can say in 60 words? You can't say fucking anything. You can barely say, this is where the object's from. But yeah, right, you have... Six seconds and 50 words to communicate everything someone needs to know about an object at a museum. What is the most important narrative that you can tell in a gallery where you have a couple of hundred words plus the object them objects themselves? Does this number improve with audio guides? Uh, sort of. Right, so audio guides are allowed to be longer, uh, and it does increase the amount of time people spend uh, looking at the objects, but the question of whether or not that or other types of technology actually improve information retention is ambiguous. So, so yes, it does increase the amount of time to a, a bit over a minute, uh, and it does increase the number of words because audio guides, when someone's talking to you, it can be a little bit longer. Um, they still won't read the text label, but the audio label uh, can have a little bit more. But if you go with, back to them the next day and ask them about the objects, whether or not they actually remember anything about it, not sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Uh, what factors are actually determining which is a bit iffy. But yeah, what can you do in that space? Saying alt act can and should do the heavy lifting doesn't reflect the realities of who is going to all to cultural institutions. It doesn't reflect m most of the work that goes on. And so, on the one hand, yes, museums still should be giving more talks, platforming more researchers. Uh, publicizing their talks properly instead of not doing that. 
uh, basically doing anything, um, right? All of the stuff that our, Alexandra is advocating for here is good stuff that should happen, but it should be done with an understanding of the limitations of what those are. Archives are chronically underfunded. A lot of museums, like, heck, I was, chat, I was looking at, uh, cause I'm starting to do my actual job search. I saw a job for a museum curator in Exeter, New Hampshire. It is one of the only paid jobs at this museum. As the sole curator, the sole collections manager, and the head of tours uh, and outreach. Right, doing all three of those things. It was a part-time $20 an hour position. Because that's what the museum has budgeted for. We love that, don't we? We, we love that so much. Um, but right, if that's the limitations all the act in and heritage institutions are working in, expecting them to add a lot more stuff to that is difficult. Expecting them to just be good at making digital content is actually a big ask. Uh, asking them to have thoroughly digitized collections uh, to be able to do complex interpretation work is difficult to ask. Asking them to, asking a sole curator to be up to date on multiple fields of history to be able to communicate that scholarship, not happening. There are simply too many demands on people, especially at small institutions, for that to work. Now, could the Met do more and afford to do more? Yes. Should the Met be doing more? Yes. The Getty Institute is already doing a bonkers amount. We love them for that. But for so many institutions within the alt act sphere, this is a completely nonsensible, uh, this is a non-starter of a sentence. Because they are already doing the, the professionals working in the space are already doing more than they are getting paid for and saying take the lead the charge on another major front of interpretation and outreach work nah nah teach the volunteers to also lecture exactly like, part of this job description was literally teaching the vol training the volunteers on giving tours, uh, and hosting other events. That's a part-time job. In Exeter. Exeter is about that big. This town is tiny. So, like, there's, there's a fundamental disconnect here in this perception of what can alt act do that's skewed by the ultra high budget institutions that's causing a lot of trouble. So, right, I mean, in, in pure history, we're seeing the same thing, right? Not every institution has the university capability that Harvard does or that Oxford does. And so, if we are judging, right, if we are judging what structural support universities and academics individual researchers and teachers at the university are able to do the, I don't know, Bryn Mawr in Chicago is going to have different restrictions than the University of South Dakota is going to have different restrictions than Harvard and lumping them all in in very run there's all steps all of them can do, but there's a lot of complicated policy development that needs to happen here in order for any of this to work. And targeting advocacy, assuming institutions have the uh, bureaucracy and support of an R1 research institution, a 
it's not going to be very effective advocacy within academia. Right? It's all about having an impact right now. Ultimately, where I'm at, wh where I'm at right now is what do we do that has an impact? For an audience that is trying to actively learn, the rules play fundamentally different than an audience where history is a leisure activity. And, I mean, for most people here, I would say probably history is a leisure activity. Most people tuning in live or watching the VOD, if I'm wrong, please leave a comment. Boost the algorithm. I believe in you. Um, but I'd say uh, it's probably generally... I'd say probably generally history is a thing you do in your spare time as you have energy to do it. And you like learning, but it's not the thing you do. Waves and independent researchers. See, Zoe, you are an exception. Uh, I, the creator right now, am halfway an exception. Right, people who are in school are an exception here, but, you know, for the folks who are full-time employed, right, exactly, it's not get research good, but yeah, it's supplementing what you've got, finding fun trivia, right, finding good pub trivia facts, weird wiki links, we love that, um, but yeah, right, so, folks who are in school uh, are one big group, public. Um, folks who are doing this as leisure time for entertainment or for uh, good pub trivia facts are another big public. And people who do it purely in leisure is... Yeah, history is your hobby. And so, you know, if push comes to shove and you run out of time, well, you no longer do history. Given that, there's a whole bunch of restrictions in place in what outreach has in effect. Right? Ask Historians gets criticism all the time for uh, being too restrictive. Right? Some, it, its model clearly works. But there's a comment like every week, a post of like, why are you constantly deleting things? Let us talk about history. And that's coming from a place of enthusiasm, right? Broadly. That's coming from a place of... I like sharing the trivia I have learned, and that I think is true, and I like talking with other people who think those historical myths are fun. And so, you know, if we compare... Ask Historians to... Let's just look at how big r slash history is. Ask Historians has 1.6 million uh, members. Our history, which Ask Historians yells about every other week, has 17.4 million. Ten times the amount of uh, people who like what they're doing. And right, there's a lot of just news posts, right? News post, news post, news post, news post. Question, discussion or question, news post, news post. Random question. And the conversations, right, there's no vouching for the quality of historical information here. But for people who are engaging with it in a very casual way, who are engaging in it in a leisure and trivia way, this is super successful and fills their needs. I'm not going to have a good time there because, like, there's not a space for, the amount of space for a professional historian to, unless they're really good at writing really snappy answers and are perpetually online to get the, those early snappy posts, they're not going to have a great time here. And that's what we found, is that the folks that ask historians, right, attracts way more professional historians into the answering pool than Ask History does, even accounting for the size differential, or especially accounting for the size differential. Uh, and so, the reason for that is that this is, a, Ask Historians, 
gives a much more space for explaining the whys and the contingencies and the places we don't know with a structure that supports that. As history doesn't have a structure that supports that, and so for people engaging with history as entertainment, this works great. People trying to do active outreach work, the market's already full and they can't compete. And that's the core thing I keep coming back to. Right now, history is a leisure activity and the market is pretty full. And that makes a lot of the core discussion around advocacy really goddamn difficult right now. I mean, I don't think, and of course I don't think this is, uh, um, is... Why is my chat box dead? You know, I just realized that my chat box is dead. You feeling okay? I'll have to bug that later. Take a look at that later. Huh. Chad, I miss you. You're not on stream here talking. Meme answer, we're going through the real end of history. Francis Fukuyama, I hear you. You were right all along. And it's been dead all stream, yeah. I'll have to bug Streamlabs to figure out what the fuck's going on there. Uh -huh. No, it, it was it was not off on purpose. It's just OBS is OBS broke, uh, and Streamlabs broke, and they're not playing nice with each other right now, and I don't know why. Boo. Uh, but anyway, right? I certainly don't think the cause is hopeless. Otherwise, I'd like shut down the channel and just walk away. Right, if I thought it was hopeless, I'd walk away. We're not doing that. No way in hell we're doing that. Uh, so I think, what's the good news here, right? W w what is the good news on Outreach? Firstly, um, the fact that people are talking about it more... Uh, ...is already a good sign, right? That's an important first step, even though Right now, we're not at the level of developing meaningful handbooks or policy to help guide outreach work. The fact that people are actually talking about that is already a good beginning and lets us start envisioning policy rather than working just purely off of vibes. Secondly, uh, the folks that are starting to have success are increasingly starting to locate each other. Uh, and there's some backend stuff here that I am not talk, um, talking about in detail, uh, but there are, there are groups that are actually putting people experimenting in this space together and actually getting some real fun uh, conversations going here. Third fun thing, right, is that while if you put stuff out there, they will come, is not successful. What is clear is that uh, there are projects that are extremely successful and uh, there is being increasing willingness from creators with successful platforms to talk to uh, people with professional training and make sure that what they're doing is good and be able to revisit those assumptions, uh, revisit their past work and move on. Honestly, I think OSP is kind of leading the charge in that regard uh, on, on the YouTube space in terms of massively popular and uh, being pretty self-critical about that work. Uh, but there's plenty of other folks who are doing really fun, good work in that space too. And so, right, this collaborative model is starting to really kind of take hold and have some interesting payoffs, both in terms of things being satisfying for us and in terms of attracting more eyes to things, right? Uh, obviously, I've been experimenting a lot with having guests on, having collaboration, having dialogue between professionals, and I, I'd say they work pretty well, right? Uh, the God of War Ragnarok streams are doing extremely well, uh, and the Pentiment streams were so much fun. And that sort of treatment and honing those methods of being able to host people and get eyes, host professionals, have a real dialogue, 
and get eyes on it to be able to convert that uh, dialogue into actual interaction and noticeable awareness. It's pretty cool. It's, it's, it's pretty cool. I think there's a lot to be learned here. I think there's also a, a lot of room for Ralph uh, in the field with developing like meaningful policies. Right? Develop, taking inspiration. Exactly. Max Miller does some phenomenal work as well, reaching out to food historians uh, and making all of that happen. It's excellent. Uh, but yeah, uh, I think the thing we can learn from Altac and heritage institutions, though, uh, especially libraries and archival institutions is the importance of, like, good policy, and how to write good policy. Because... It's one thing to be like, oh yeah, we should all do outreach work, and then, but have specific guides on, you know, what types of material are we doing outreach work, how do we respond to audience feedback, uh, how do we uh, engage in productive dialogue, and having like really competently written policy to help guide that work and to guide getting guests on, guide what is ethical ethical collaboration and ethical platforming uh, is I think a really important next step. And that's something that we're starting to see glimmerings of, but right, I mean there is no professional organization right now to shape that policy. I think that's the next big step. Right, the next big milestone for outreach historians is a professional organization on especially digital outreach. That is itself accessible, that is itself, itself informal enough uh, to... I informal enough to attract diverse audiences uh, and not gatekeep that is uh, committed enough to its own Kool-Aid to actually, like, uh, not be hijacked by hegemonic professional historians or denigrated, and to provide legitimacy within academia for people doing that outreach work. I don't know how that professional organization will come to be, but maybe that's a long-term goal here, is developing actual professional organizations. But that, that, I think, is the next big milestone, and I think is an important thing to... Uh, that we're starting to get to the point of being, like, needing. And the fact that we're at the point where we just need that, that uh, the uh, association, or the American Historical Association, that Society of American Archivists, or any of those other ones aren't enough, right, I think is actually encouraging news rather than discouraging news. So I'd be curious. I'd be curious to get people's thoughts on that in particular. Uh, but yeah, I think that about sums up where my thoughts are at. at a mere two hours, uh, right? The, there is a lot to like here, but I think there is also a lot. But the, there's a lot of discourse right now that turned that into a, that turning the aspirations into like, meaningful things is... Huh. What can you as the audience do? That's a super good question, Wolfie. Right, because I've been talking a lot from the creator end, from the his professional historian end. But yeah, from an audience end, right, there's a few things. I think the first one is... Word of mouth is the... Pretty clearly, the most successful tool for audience building. Right? Posting announcements everywhere gets some attention, but on a practical level, right, the reason a collection of unmitigated pedantry became successful is not because of any search engine optimization. It's not because gaming any algorithms. It's a blog. It's its own web page. You can go game Google a little bit with uh, being super topical, but broadly speaking, ACOOP got popular by word of mouth. OSP got popular uh, due to some lucky algorithm explosions, but then a lot of word of mouth. 
So, telling people that you think will be interested in creators you like about those creators and inviting them into that space is a core way of um, starting that snowball turning. Right? Because eventually algorithms will see this and say, oh, this is getting a lot of attention. We should recommend this more. But that starts with audiences being invested and engaged and spreading the word. Right? And you don't have to bully your friends into showing up, though, you know, I won't be opposed to that. Uh, but yeah, right? Something I really enjoy, I think you would too. We'll talk about this. Hey, I. Oh, it comes up and you're talking about something related to. Hey, I. So and so was playing this. I thought you'd really like it. Oh, there's a video about this. Let me send it to you. Um, and just inviting the people in that space, creating that engagement, commenting for the algorithm, right? Doing those small things helps. If you discover something cool, right? My space is always open for you to share cool things uh, that you have found. People may not have time because it, it is a leisure activity. And so people may not have time or energy to actually engage with it, but, you know, share it around. Sh share around other people you like in my spaces, share around my stuff in other spaces. Try and sort of create that rising tide. And so, right, that, that I think is one of the single biggest things. Uh, if there are feedback systems, you know, uh, actually engage with those systems. Uh, if you see your local museum is doing a digital exhibition, make sure you go look at that. Make sure you get them those view metrics uh, and are uh, actually comment on it, have trying to open a dialogue with the folks who created it. Uh, right? All of that is, of course, within your bounds, within your reason, but the more thoughtful engagement uh, audience an already engaged audience is able to have within the historical space, the more that encourages the systems that are currently being obstacles to instead be systems that promote it and help kind of sweep us along. Uh, also, uh, if you're noticing that your YouTube algorithm is trying to link, like, I don't know, I'll just use my stuff as an example. If YouTube is linking my stuff uh, to some like fringe stuff that you're not comfortable with, use the uh, don't recommend this channel to me options. Anything that sort of tells the algorithm, hey, no, these two things should not be paired together. They are not a good mix to prevent people starting off with good stuff and then kind of going increasingly, increasingly fringe thanks to algorithmic rabbit holes. Uh, right, these are all extremely microscopic things. These are not going to have enormous impacts because the main obstacles are systemic, not individual. But they are concretely actionable. And to, concretely actionable with a slight impact is itself, you know, a really good first step for action. Going forward, uh, as I think as things develop, as ideas for like professional audiences show up, uh, try and keep an ear out for places where there can be public feedback, and then participate in that feedback. Uh, I know that's time consuming and difficult, and as always, I'll repeat that again, it's an as you have time to do that, but the more of that engagement work you can do to help like make outreach projects uh, more polished. Uh, more impactful and just better uh, the better this ecosystem becomes to create continue to support more content potentially it might even go so far as to open up new markets or to create more space within the market for these projects that I in the, even though I currently think the market is like 75% saturated I don't think it's totally saturated but I think it's close so I think that, that answers that as some relatively concrete lists of things that are maybe doable. Exactly. Bad content. No. Stop.
What about it, folks? Did, did that all sound... Was that all coherent, firstly? Uh, and do those concerns and thoughts seem... Do, do you agree with them? Get in the comments. If you've been lurking, get in the comments. Uh, what, like, do you think those thoughts, uh, actually, actually clues together into an actual argument? Seem to you, but you're deep down in the rabbit hole of yourself. Look, we're in these minds together, Johnny. Someday we'll dig ourselves out. Probably, maybe. Actually, definitely not, but we'll, we'll hold on to that hope anyway. You're with me on most, if not all, of my points. Exactly, dig up. <laughs> yep. We're... Look, uh, I am also applying to jobs, like, there's one doing, like, digital exhibit work for the Getty. Which would be rad, but also, you know, if I'm complaining about it when I'm a private citizen on a tiny channel, oh boy, what's it gonna be like for the Getty Institute? Keeps being more, yeah. Keep pulling more people in hopes that we may use them as footholds to get out, but it never works and you're just getting more people in the mines. Yep. More people in the mines. More people in the mines. I believe. <laughs> Uh, some at some point we'll pull everyone into the mines with us and then we'll make a mole people society. It'll be a, it'll be great and be full of good history. We promise. Join the mole people today. Our history crab bucket? <laughs> Alright. Well, then I, it, sounds, it sounds like chat is thoroughly on the same page, which is awesome and also unsurprising given that, uh, you know, you're watching me. Presumably, that means you already vibe with me. One, one would hope. I think that's how content works. Um, so yeah, I think we will call it a day there. So, as always, if you did enjoy this and have not yet, do join the folks today uh, in hitting that follow button. Uh, it helps a lot. We stream multiple times a week. Usually we're playing games, but I, I want to do more of these just chatting things about different uh, different historical content, uh, different ideas of history on public space. Uh, and, you know, having these conversations is, I think, worthwhile, even though I don't know that's necessarily fun. You're talking to give me a point for something I need to write, so thanks for that. Woohoo! I, lo I love that. I love being able to consolidate the thoughts into ways that are actually useful for people. Um, but yeah. Uh, next up, coming up, coming up this week is just, it's a bonkers week, right? Tomorrow, I've got the schedule on the schedule pit tab of the Twitch page, but uh, it's also on the Discord. Tomorrow's God of War Ragnarok. Uh, then we'll be streaming Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday uh, next week. So we'll have three back-to-back -back streams and becoming a full-time streamer, what is this? But the 31st is a busy day for the history games community. But the 31st we're going to be finishing Final Fantasy VII Remake. It also is the launch day for two new games. The first one, which we're going to be playing on Wednesday, is Inclinati, the long-awaited medieval marginalia tactics game. It looks extremely goofy. It looks not at all serious. Uh, it looks very Terry Gilliam-esque. And we love that. So we'll be playing that on Wednesday. And then on Thursday, we're completely reversing our vibes to play Season uh, A Story for the Future, which is a brand new game that I saw one review for, the website for, and I'm now on the media blackout for because I don't want to get spoiled on it because it looks so good. But uh, it's a game where you're playing as an archivist creating a record of a world before it ends. And you have one day to do that. And it is... Uh, it looks so good, and given that we're being an archivist, I'm in a cultural heritage degree. One of the institutions that we talk about a lot is archives. So I have some archival um, best practices documents. This isn't quite ICOM Code of Ethics, because I think this is not going to be roasting the Black Haven Historical Society. This is going to be celebrating uh, archival work and trying to be as ethical as possible, 
according to U.S. and Australian best practices. It's... I'm so excited. Uh, there's, there's a couple of really cool documents that came out of Australia on how to do oral history work uh, with indigenous or marginalized communities, and we may try and use those to inform what decisions we make in the game. So, if you want to see the archival research progress, I'm going to be experimenting with how that works. Uh, while just enjoying the fact that that game looks so, so gorgeously melancholic. I'm so excited. So, and then obviously, um, one week from tomorrow, we'll be back with Pentiment, with a book historian, Ali Alphys, who I am extremely excited to have on, because, of course, why would we not be excited? It's more Pentiment. You know, you know the drill. So. I hope I'll see you for all of those. Do make sure you get followed to be notified when those happen. Uh, chat is hype. Everyone watching the VOD should be hype. Come join us live for them. It'll be so fun. Uh, but yeah, thank you all for the support and for indulging me in these conversations. I will see you all tomorrow, okay? Bye-bye.